I almost can't believe it, but yes, here we are back again with another handheld that uses the Unisoc Tiger T618 chipset that now has been seen in seven different handhelds from various manufacturers. This time around, Ambernick is back again with a different take, switching it up quite literally and going vertical with this release. The RG405V is their third handheld with a T618 and comes with a 4 inch 4 3 aspect ratio display. In terms of performance, we are quite familiar with its capabilities on the channel. However, let's see if Ambernick has addressed some issues from the past with their Android build and explore some of the potential benefits of this vertical format. I invite you to join me as we explore everything that the RG405V offers and see if this is the T618 handheld that you've been waiting for. Coming off the intro, let's get to the specs of the Ambernick RG405V. This handheld comes equipped with a 4 inch 4.3 IPS display at a resolution of 640x480 and features the very popular Unisoc Tiger T618 with two A75 cores at 2GHz and six A55 cores at 2GHz and the Mali G52 GPU at 850MHz. Every configuration comes with 4GB of LP DDR4X RAM and 128GB of internal eMMC storage. In addition, the storage is expandable via the micro SD slot and there are various options available that come either with or without a preloaded micro SD card. It features Wi-Fi 802.11ac, Bluetooth 5.0, and a USB Type-C port for data and charging. It comes with a fairly substantial 5500mAh battery which Ambernick claims takes 3 hours to fully charge and has 9 hours of battery life. The RG405V ships with Android 12 out of the box. It is available now direct from Ambernick's website, AliExpress, and Amazon.com, and the cheapest model is available for approximately 138 US dollars. I will have links down in the description if you are interested in purchasing. I'd like to thank Ambernick for sending me this unit for the purpose of this review, and as I always require, this video was not reviewed prior to publishing. Alright, it's time to unbox the RG405, and it's always important to be as gentle as you can. So let's quickly take a look around the box itself, and this is fairly standard Ambernick packaging that is nice and clean. You can see we have various color options available for the RG405, which comes in that DMG gray, a wood grain color, and then the transparent purple. Other than that, there's not a whole lot going on here. So let's get this cover off and reveal what's inside. First thing, I can't help but notice the face that greets us inside the package. It always makes me smile seeing it on a lot of these vertical handhelds. Okay, let's remove the 405V and put it aside for a moment while we check out the rest of the contents. Here's a plastic insert to hold the device, and removing this, we have everything else revealed. So let's start with the fairly standard USB Type-C to Type-A cable. Next, we have the 405V user manual, and this is a pretty simple sheet that does have some useful information to reference. My particular unit does come with an included 128GB game card. Here we've got some wipes so we can properly clean and prep the screen for this included screen protector which is always nice to have. Back to the 405V so we can reveal the device and free it from its baggie. I can already see the Skittles buttons peeking through the plastic. And you can see that I did receive the transparent purple which is always such a cool color and it does look really nice here. I do wish I had a purple Game Boy Color to compare the tones, but I will be comparing it with some other purple devices in just a little bit. The 405V is definitely a chonker, but this feels really nice and solid in the hands, and those grips in the back really make this a very different feeling device. Okay, let's tour around the device briefly before we get into the nitty gritty of it. Let's start out at the top of the device, and here you can see we have an indicator light on the right, the exhaust vent for the active cooling in the middle, and then a USB Type-C port which is used for data and charging. Coming around to the left side of the device, here we have the dedicated button to bring up the Ambernick launcher, and below that we have the micro SD slot for expandable storage. Let's move down to the bottom of the handheld, and I do really love the smooth curves of this device. There are no harsh edges here. At the bottom we have the down firing speakers, and then the 3.5mm headset port in the middle. And then on the right side we have a few more things to make note of, with the power button and the volume up and down rocker placed here at the top. The back of the RG405V has the four shoulder buttons and the intake vent for that active cooling. You can see the large battery also peeking through my transparent purple shell. 
Now let me hold this at an angle so you can see these pronounced grips that are on the back of the RG405V, which really makes this a nice and comfy handle to hold. It's a pretty unusual design, and I've only seen this on a pretty mediocre handheld, the Dute, which was basically a POW Kitty RGB20S clone. Here's a closer look at these shoulder buttons, which press down nicely and don't require a lot of force. They are satisfying to press down with just the right amount of travel for a button like this. I also like that Ambernick placed these at an angle to accommodate how your fingers will hold the device and rest on these back shoulder buttons. Now on the front side, we've got all of our face button controls in the lower half of the device. This is using a D-pad up top configuration with both analog sticks at the bottom. And of course, we've got the really solid D-pad that has become pretty standard for a lot of the Ambernick devices. This has really solid movement, pivot, and travel when pressing down at the ends. You can see that nice range from side to side at this angle. Below that, we can see how the analog sticks sit above the face of the unit, and these are Switch-style sticks, so they are on the smaller side. No issues here, they move and click in smoothly. Below the analog sticks, we have the Start and Select button, which are membrane-based and pressed down similar to the face buttons, which we will check out next. The face buttons are set up in the Nintendo-style BAYX configuration, and this transparent purple features the Skittles buttons that my friend Joey from Joey's Retro Handhelds is quite fond of. These feel really great to press down on with a nice amount of travel. They don't have any issues like rubbing against the shell or getting stuck. And at this angle, we can see how they press down and also how the buttons sit above the face of the device. So let's turn this thing on and get going. At first, you will be greeted by this initial configuration process, which will take a few minutes to complete the first time, so we will quickly go through this process. Welcome to the home screen of the RG405V, and if you are accustomed at all with the other Ambernick Android devices like the 405M or RG505, this will look very familiar to you. Now in the past, I've definitely had some mixed opinions about Ambernick's Android build, and for both the 405M and RG505, I am a big fan of Gamma OS, which I've done multiple videos on, and I've heard might be coming to the 405V as well. However, let's take a look and see what's in store for us here. So swiping down from the top, we have the quick access functionality of Android, and here we have various options that are useful. You can see that we have the ability to adjust the performance and set it to higher auto. We have fan controls as well, and there is the option to keep it off, set it to auto, cool, or strong. A few other things are available here, including the option to toggle on the key mapper, switching between Nintendo or Xbox style inputs, and then toggling on the Ambernick front end. Looking through the installed apps, and this is a pretty clean build of Android that does have lots of emulators preloaded. The RG405V does have Google Play support right out of the box. You will most likely want to update some of the emulators here as I have found that some of them are using older versions. Let's turn on the Ambernick front end and this can be activated by either pressing the dedicated button on the left of the device or by selecting it in the quick access dropdown. Let's take a quick look at what this front end from Ambernick offers. Again, if you are familiar with other Ambernick devices, this is more of the same. As you can tell, this is a very clean and simple launcher divided into the consoles that are available here to emulate. Pressing select will bring up a menu that allows you to change the style and theme for the launcher. I'll quickly run through the various styles here, and really, there isn't a whole lot going on. Personally, I'd recommend using something different like Daijisho. Now on the hardware side, the RG405V is overall a nicely put together device. Those grips on the back really make this one nice and comfy to hold, and the curved bottom accommodates your palms nicely. On the back of the device, there are extra grooves for your fingers to rest in, which again just adds to the overall comfort of the RG405V. The plastics here are really solid, and the entire shell holds up really well to my bend test with minimal flexing. Now the display on hand is the same one that Amberdick used in the RG405M, which is a 4 inch 640x480 resolution panel that despite its lower resolution has a fairly solid picture. Now this is definitely not the brightest display I've seen in a handheld, but it is more than enough indoors and the brightness does scale really well to allow for nighttime viewing. Despite the lower resolution, I don't think it's much of an issue given what can be emulated on this device, and it's actually for most uses a resolution that makes a lot of sense. However, the same issue as I mentioned for my RG405M review, which is the lower resolution being noticeable when navigating around Android. And when it comes to native Android gaming, some games will not scale well to that lower resolution and 4-3 aspect ratio. And yet again, for whatever reason, Ambernick has the picture over sharpened, which was the same issue present on the RG505 and 405M, and was only corrected once we got Gamma OS on both of those devices. As I mentioned earlier, there's a very high likelihood that the 405V will receive similar treatment, correcting one of the most annoying issues I have with Ambernick's Android build. 
Now for sound, it definitely gets pretty loud, and I was worried that the speaker cutouts were muffling some of the capabilities of the speakers. However, I actually kept the back cover off to compare the differences and didn't find it to be that much of a difference, but I'll leave that one up to you and here's a comparison between the two. Finally, let's check out this D-pad and then the analog stick. I'll go to my usual Marvel vs. Capcom and this is responsive and works well here. I'm not really having any issues pulling off combos and moving around on screen, and this is pretty standard membrane-based Ambernic D-pad, which I find to be some of the best out of these Chinese handhelds. Lastly, I wanted to check out the analog stick sensitivity, and I'm coming fresh off my Pow Kitty X55 review, and those sticks there were overly sensitive. On the 405V, they are definitely much better, and movement is better matched to accommodate the scaling of our on-screen characters, such as Daxter, and of course Mario here. I always like using Mario 64 for this test because Mario has a range of speed when moving and what you don't want to see is Mario taking right off with the smallest of movements in the analog stick and so the analog sticks here as you can see are pretty solid. So it's that time that we get some visitors to help us out and size up the RG405 to other handhelds. This time around I've got the assortment of all T618 handhelds and of course let's start out with the RG405V first and get its weight. The 405V comes in at just a little over 10 ounces or 286 grams. Next up is another chunky boy, the Retroid Pocket Flip, coming in at 271 grams or about 9.5 ounces. One more Retroid device with the metal version of the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, coming in at 286 grams or a little over 10 ounces, making it nearly identical in weight to the RG405V. And then the non-metal version of the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, coming in slightly over 8 ounces or 235 grams. Here's Ambernick's other 4.3 T618 handheld, the RG405M, which has a metal shell and this weighs in at a little over 9 ounces or 236 grams. And then the third and final Ambernick T618 handheld, the RG505, which has become a recent favorite of mine thanks to Gamma OS. This one weighs in at 287 grams or a little over 10 ounces, making the RG505 and 405V almost identical in weight. Now moving on to some PAL Kitty devices, here is the X28, which actually has the largest screen of all the T618 handhelds. This one comes in at 10.5 ounces or 299 grams. And then the X18S, which is actually the heaviest one here, weighing in at almost 11 ounces or 307 grams. Despite the chunkiness of the 405V and its active cooling, it still manages to not be the heaviest of all these handhelds. Now moving on to some measurements, let's check out the size of these face buttons on the RG405V, which comes in at a little under 7.5mm with an analog stick cap of 14.5mm. The top portion has a thickness of 16.5mm with the bottom half having a thickness of 21mm at the center, and then the curvy handles coming in at a little over 29mm, giving us some solid grips on this handheld. In comparison, I wanted to size up the other chunky device, the Pocket Flip, which is a little over 25mm when closed. The face buttons on here are also a little smaller than the RG405V, coming in at 7.1mm. And quickly looking at another Ambernick device to compare against, the RG405M which has those standard Ambernick sized face buttons at 7.6mm. And as a reminder, here is the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus which has the smallest face buttons coming in at 6.5mm and it's also one of the thinnest T618 handhelds measuring in at a little over 14mm. And finally, I thought it would be fun to grab a few other transparent purple devices that I have in my collection and compare the colors between these handhelds. I've got some cool devices here with the RG353V, MiU Mini Plus, Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, and of course the RG405V. Right off the bat, the MiU Mini Plus has a completely different transparent purple that's going on here. And then comparing the RG353V, which is another Ambernick device, these shades of purple here are quite similar. I think what throws it off a little bit is that Ambernick went with a really cool white motherboard on the RG405V. And finally, here is the Pocket 3 Plus, which definitely has a deeper purple tone compared to the grayer tone of the RG405V. I really do wish I had a purple Game Boy Color to compare and see which is closest to that color. Okay, enough of that, it's time for one of my favorite segments, and let's tear the RG405V down and see what interesting things await us. 
Let me size up the bit first, and as Ambernick always does, the shell is using hex screws and it looks like the 1.5mm hex bit will do the trick. There are 6 total screws holding the back cover in place, so let's go ahead and quickly get these out so we can remove the cover and take a look inside. Okay, with the screws removed, let's figure out the best way to separate the shell. Because the case is transparent, you can see where those retention tabs are, which is useful to know where we should use a pry to begin the separation. I recommend using a wedge tool or a guitar pick so you don't damage the plastic. I found that the bottom of the shell is the best place to get a tool in there and separate the tabs. You can see once I did that, it was fairly simple to continue separating the shell. Here's a look at the other side of that back cover and we can see how these shoulder buttons are set up here. And here's a nice centered shot of the device with the back cover removed. The battery definitely stands out here as it's essentially taking up half of the space in the RG45V. Let me quickly disconnect the battery so we can check it out a bit more. As you can see here, we have a 5500mAh battery which is the largest Ambernick has used in a T618 device. As I mentioned before, the 405V has active cooling which is the first time Ambernick has done this with a T618 device. And it's a decently sized fan that we have here. I've got to say I am pretty impressed with everything here, there was clearly thought put into how things were laid out and arranged here. So we're going to go ahead and remove this plastic shell that the battery sits in so we can continue on with our teardown. We will need to switch bits now and I'm going to go with a Phillips head size triple zero which should serve us well for the rest of the way. Okay, let's quickly get this plastic piece out of here. We now have better access to the controller board and looking at it we can see the ribbon cable coming through from the analog sticks. There are 6 screws in place that will need to be removed and we will also need to remove the speakers from the unit before being able to get the controller board out. Okay, with both speakers out now, we can now remove the 6 controller board screws so we can finally take a look at the face buttons and analog sticks. Make sure to lift the retention tab on the ribbon cable and disconnect it from the board before continuing on. I'll go ahead and now quickly remove the screws. One last thing, make sure to disconnect the ribbon cable for the display and again it is held into place with a retention tab so make sure to lift it up and then pull the cable out gently. Once all of that is done, the board will come out very easily. You can see how clean this board is and on the opposite side the board is printed in white since this is a transparent shell and as a result will look really sharp with that white showing through. Okay so now we can finally get a closer look here and as I suspected the analog sticks are replaceable without much issue which is always good to see here. Now personally, I am curious about these face buttons as they appear to be a little bit different than what I've seen on other Ambernick devices. So off camera, I went ahead and disassembled my RG353M which uses pretty much what I'd consider standard Ambernick face buttons. In fact, these were swapped in for my RG405M and so most of them are interchangeable. Unfortunately for the RG405V, these are not interchangeable and they are different than what we've seen in other Ambernick devices. Now the issue isn't the diameter of the buttons as they do clear the inside of the shell, instead they are actually a different height with the RG405V face button being a bit taller. Not only that, they are keyed differently and so the A button will be placed in a different orientation on that 405V. Here's a closer look at how the A button from the RG353M and 405M sit inside of the shell and you can see how I have to keep rotating it to fit properly since it is keyed differently. Once I am able to get it to sit correctly, you can see how the A button is upside down on the 405V, but not only that, it is much shorter, and so long story short, the face buttons on the 405V are unique to this device. And with that, I think we've learned a lot here, and now it's time to move on and check out some synthetic numbers and see if the 405V is keeping up with the other T618 devices on the market. And numbers here are looking really good. I have the 405V set to its high performance mode, but the fan set to the highest setting in order to push the numbers as high as possible. First up with Geekbench 6, you can see that the 405V on this stock Ambernick firmware is keeping up there with the best of them in terms of performance and matches what we expect from this T618. The same story can be seen here with the Antutu benchmarks and again, numbers are definitely close to what we've seen with the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus and on par with what I would expect from the T618 running in a higher performance setting. Finally, let's check out the 3D Mark Wildlife benchmark and surprisingly I was able to get the best numbers out of all the devices with the 405V coming in at 743. Now keep in mind this is all synthetic benchmarking and really the most important thing is how real world gaming is and unsurprisingly it's exactly as we would expect from the T618 in that high performance setting. So this is a great opportunity to start showing off some games and first let's start out with some native Android games. 
Now, as I mentioned earlier, Android gaming can go either way as we are dealing with a lower resolution display at 640 by 480 that is also using a 4.3 aspect ratio, which is something that not all native Android games will scale well to. In my own personal testing and just experience with the 405M and now the 405V, I have found that many games do quite well and actually scale down just fine. Here's Grand Mountain Adventure, which is an awesome premium Android game that is also available part of the Google Play Pass subscription. It's well worth trying out, and as you can see, it scales well to the 405V display, and enabling the high graphics setting cleans things up nicely so that it looks pretty good on here. Another Android game that I am quite fond of is the twin stick shooter 20 minutes till dawn, which mostly does well, but at time I did find the text a little hard to read because of the lower resolution, and so it's a good example that not everything will be absolutely perfect with native Android gaming. Finally, one last Android game and another that's part of the Google Play Pass. Super Mambo Quest is an incredible platformer that really is worth anyone's attention, especially if you are interested in this style of game. This one is another example of a game that does scale well to the lower resolution display with text that is fully readable. And before we move on from native Android games, let's check out the built-in gamepad mapping feature which is definitely going to be useful for something like Genshin Impact and a game that is playable on a device like the RG45V and will change the entire experience allowing one to make use of the controls built in here. So it's pretty simple to bring up the gamepad mapper by simply using the pull down quick access menu built into Android. You can then select gamepad mapper from here. Now because of the resolution we're dealing with here, it is a bit crammed, but still manageable. You can map all the controls here and turn on and off any controls as you need. So let me go through this quickly just to get Genshin to the point that I can show you what it's like when it's all been configured. You can move around buttons and place them to correspond with the on-screen actions as needed. In addition, you can activate the left and right analog sticks, and once that is done, you can also adjust the sizing of them. For the right analog stick, you have the ability to toggle its behavior, which is useful depending on the game that you are playing. Once you have everything the way you like, you just simply hit save and select switch to activate the controls and then close the window. You can now easily control Genshin Impact with the built-in controller of the 405V, which makes this a pretty pleasant experience here on this device. Now it's time to move on to emulation, and the reality here is that at this point, after 6 devices that came prior to this one, we have a good amount of familiarity with what to expect from the T618 chipset, and so this is more of a showcase of games running on the RG405V and how they look and play here. I opted to feature games that maybe I haven't shown before or just some personal favorites, and I did try to stay away from the usuals. Let's start out with something that is pretty light for a device like this, but I did want to show how Game Boy Advance looks on a 4.3 display, given that Game Boy Advance uses a 3.2 aspect ratio, and honestly, things look great here. The 4 inch display is large enough that anything we lose to the black borders isn't as significant here. I've personally been on a bit of a Game Boy Advance kick recently, and have really enjoyed featuring gameplay from this handheld. Games like The Legend of Zelda The Minish Cap, which is actually one of my personal favorite Zelda games, looks really great here and checking out some interesting ports to the Game Boy Advance like Crash Nitro Kart, which if you're not familiar is an awesome kart racer featuring all of the characters from the world of Crash Bandicoot and quite an impressive title for the Game Boy Advance. But given that we are dealing with a 4-3 aspect ratio display, to me this is one of the highlights of a device like the RG405V as it will cover so many platforms that are well suited to that aspect ratio. In fact, the entire 5th generation, including PlayStation 1, Nintendo 64, and Sega Saturn all look great here on the 405V's 4-inch screen. Not only that, but as I mentioned, the lower resolution isn't as much of an issue here as games still look great and clean up nicely. PlayStation 1 emulation with Duck Station is as expected very solid since the T618 provides more than enough power to run this generation, as well as the other 5th generation consoles without much trouble. Ridge Racer Type 4 is running fast and fluid and just looks great with it being a perfect fit for this device. The same can be said for Nintendo 64 emulation using some Mupin 64 Plus and even harder to run games like Cruisin' in World is having no issues with the T618 and 405V. And of course I have to show off a bit of Super Mario 64 running on this display since I think it looks fantastic and controls really well with emulation being spot on. It's another great example of why the 4.3 display is a solid way to go. And saving one of my personal favorite platforms, the Sega Saturn with Yaba Senshiro is performing really well on the 405V 
and the Unisoc T618, which is a platform that is definitely much more difficult to emulate. As you can see, something like Sega Rally Championship, which is always a blast to pick up and play through, runs beautifully here. But while I've got Yaba Senshiro loaded up, I needed to check out one of the best shmups on the platform and perhaps ever made. Radiant Silver Gun is another game that is doing really well here with the 405V. But of course, we can't forget about Sega's follow-up console, the Sega Dreamcast, which is another platform that has no issues running quite well here on the 405V, and the T618 provides more than enough power to handle what the Dreamcast can offer, so you can take yourself caliber sessions on the go with you. Finally, I wanted to show off some of the 6th generation with PlayStation 2 and Nintendo GameCube. Now, as I've mentioned many times in various videos, I always like to consider PS2 and GameCube emulation as a bonus for this kind of device that is powered by the T618. Now, the 405V will certainly not play all the games available to us on these consoles, but given the large library of the PlayStation 2, there is still a significant number of games to enjoy. In fact, many games run quite well without much tweaking, leaving it at native resolution and requiring no underclocking. However, given that we aren't dealing with the most powerful chipset here, certain games will require some tweaking, whereas others are just not going to happen on this device, and so that's why I always like to reiterate that while a lot of games from the PS2 and GameCube will perform well, it is still far from perfect. But as you can probably tell, lighter games like Crash Bandicoot The Wrath of Cortex do really well here with the T618, and a game like this doesn't require any underclocking in Ether SX2. But then games like Simpsons Hit and Run, which might need a little bit of underclocking, still perform really well with the T618, and it's just a real treat to be able to play PS2 games in this form factor, and it's kind of hard to resist the charm of playing PS2 in a vertical format. Of course, I couldn't resist, and given my never-ending love for the Katamari series, I had to show off a bit of We Love Katamari here on the 405V, and this is another game that requires nothing specific to tweak to get it running as you see here. It's a lighter PS2 game, but a real joy to play and never gets old to me. And yes, I will show off a little bit of God of War 2, just in case you aren't familiar with the capabilities of this chipset. The T618 can handle it surprisingly well. I wouldn't consider it perfect, and you will definitely have frame drops at certain points, but it's definitely playable, and again, pretty impressive given what we are working with here. Now before we wrap up the 6th generation, let's check out some GameCube emulation, and for this I am actually using Dolphin MMJR, which I find gives me the best performance on this device. With this setup, I am able to play games like SSX Tricky that, while not perfect, is definitely pretty playable, despite some frame drops here and there, and again shows off some of the more impressive capabilities here with the Unisoc T618. And if you know me by now, I usually love to show off one of my personal favorite games on Nintendo GameCube, and one of my favorite racing games in general. Wave Race Blue Storm is always a gorgeous game to show off and does quite well here without many issues, and similar to PS2, we will definitely have a range of performance depending on the GameCube game you are trying to play, as well as which build of the Dolphin emulator you are using. Now for one last platform I wanted to talk about on the 405V, which is the PlayStation Portable. The PSP was a handheld that utilized a 16.9 widescreen display, and so obviously it's not going to be the best match for this handheld. And if you are really wanting to play strictly PSP games, I do believe some of the other T sequenting options would be a better fit. However, I know many don't mind playing PSP on a 4 3 display, and so you've probably seen some Ridge Racer playing in the background with a stretched image. And while not my personal favorite way to play, I did want to demonstrate what it looks like here on the 405V. However, you can definitely set PPSSPP to use the PSP's native aspect ratio and play with black borders on the top and bottom if you are a stickler for preserving the correct aspect ratio. With a 4 inch display here, it's not the worst experience, but ultimately I recommend another T618 device if PSP is one of your main platforms, since the T618 has more than enough performance to handle the PSP library. And as I always do, let's check out what we're looking at here with battery life on the 405V after all of this gaming. The 405V is equipped with a 5500mAh battery, and so I was pretty excited to see how things would fare in terms of battery life here compared to these, some of the other devices. First up, I'll go ahead with my usual lighter test with Yoshi's Island for the Super Nintendo, and with that 5500mAh battery, the 405V using 50% brightness, 50% volume, the fan off, and the CPU set to the auto mode, we managed to hit over 18 and a half hours of battery life, which is incredibly good and one of the better performing handles I've personally tested. I imagine that with the potential for Gamma OS, we can see those numbers go up even more. 
And then on the opposite end, pushing the 405V with a harder game to emulate, we have God of War 2 running with that high performance CPU mode and the fan turned off at 50% brightness and 50% volume. The 405V was able to manage just a little over 4 hours of battery life, which I do think is pretty solid. Finally, let's get a read on some of the surface temperatures of the device, as I suspect that, that with the active cooling, things will be staying nice and cool to the touch. So I did some stress testing first with the fan set to the highest setting to see how the device is this way, and then a second test with the fan turned off to confirm some of my own assumptions. First up, we have surface temperatures of the 405V with the fan turned all the way up, and it's keeping things nice and cool, especially around where the processor is located, and I didn't observe any temperatures above 35 degrees Celsius, which is really solid, but most important, pay attention to the temperature drop in the bottom half where you'll be spending all of your time holding the device, and it's a good 5 degrees cooler. And now let's check out these surface temperatures with the fan turned off. And as I suspected, temperatures are a little bit warmer, but nothing too extreme here. And as I've become quite accustomed to what we can expect here with the T618, it actually does quite well just being passively cooled. So really for a device like the 405V, you can easily keep that fan off and temperatures will still stay under the 40 degrees Celsius range with the lower portion staying nearly the same temperature at around 30 degrees Celsius, similar to what we saw in the first video of the device with the fan running at max. Now, as with nearly all of these handhelds, there are some issues I'd like to briefly mention. Unfortunately, one of the issues from the past in Android are still present here, like weird glitches with the on-screen navigation not showing up properly, and the awful over-sharpening of the image which I talked about earlier in the video. Thankfully, I can confirm that Amernic finally corrected the issues with the L2 and R2 mapping, and so in games like Dead Cells, we don't have any issues anymore using those buttons. Now, some other issues that I noticed, not all emulators are configured properly out of the box, and so that will definitely be frustrating for some looking for an easy pick-up-and-play device. It's not much of an issue for someone like myself, as I'm quite comfortable tweaking and tinkering with these handhelds, but I always like to think of the end user, and for sure it's something worth considering. Now despite the device being very comfortable, I did have issues accidentally pressing the L1 and R1 shoulder buttons, depending on how I was holding the device. These shoulder buttons are very easy to press down on, and so that is why those accidental presses happen, which can be annoying at times, especially depending on what those L1 and R1 buttons are mapped to. And so with all of that, I think this is a good time to wrap things up. At this point in the T618's life, we are quite comfortable with the capabilities of the chipset, and at this point we have handhelds that come in all sorts of shapes and sizes to accommodate individual needs and use cases. The RG405V is the only handheld in a vertical format that features the T618, and if you've held out this long and want a bit more power in this form factor, I think that the 405V is overall a really solid device that will make many happy, including those that love the vertical format. The best part is that this device will almost certainly get better when Gamma OS arrives on it, and so I'm really excited to see how much further we can take this handheld. At the end of the day, it's great to have another solid contender with the Unisoc T618, and I have to admit that I am looking forward to seeing what the next bump in performance will be like at this price point. But until then, as always, I am the Retro Tech Dad, and thank you so much for watching.